Over the past couple of weeks, we've been covering the perspectives of Cuban Americans here in the Bay Area who have been protesting in support of the insurrections in Cuba and against that repressive regime. But this evening, ABC Action News in-depth reporter Anthony Hill is digging deeper into the long and complicated history between the United States and Cuba and the conditions that have led thousands of Cubans to finally revolt. On July 11th, major anti-government protests break out across Cuba. People don't believe in the regime anymore. Frustrated by the government's handling of the pandemic, a shortage of food and medicine, and a lack of basic civil liberties. And now, a national discussion on the United States' role in all of this. They have to go ahead and see what the next level of, of uh, engagement would be. To understand how living conditions have deteriorated in Cuba and the decades long tumultuous relationship between the United States and the communist island nation, I spoke with five Cuban American experts. Rafael Pisano, a Cuban American activist who's traveled the world advocating for the liberation of oppressed Cubans on the island. Raul Fernandez, an immigration lawyer who has represented Cuban dissidents. Sebastian Arcos, the associate director of the Cuban Research Institute at Florida International University. Elio Mueller Jr., who served under the Clinton administration as the liaison with the Cuban American community. And Angelique Mathina, a first generation Cuban American who has made several humanitarian trips to Cuba. In 1959, Fidel Castro overthrows the U.S.-backed oppressive government of Fulgencio Batista in the Cuban Revolution, establishes himself as the new dictator, and installs a communist government forming an alliance with the Soviet Union. Because the United States controls much of the Cuban economy, Castro nationalizes all U.S. businesses with hopes of keeping wealth in Cuba. In response, the United States places an economic embargo against the island nation in 1962, essentially prohibiting U.S. companies from trading with Cuba. But it wasn't until 1996 that Congress made the embargo law. So we were very, very enthusiastic about the possibilities of what the embargo could do at that time. The economic embargo continues to be a controversial topic. Just last week, the U.N. General Assembly voted for the 29th time for the U.S. to end the embargo. But only Congress has the power to do that. Opponents say the embargo negatively impacts Cuban citizens because it prevents them from accessing necessities that could ease life there. While people who support the embargo argue it sends a stern message of disapproval to Havana. For many, life in Cuba is hard. And for decades, the United States has accepted Cuban dissidents with open arms. But with the U.S. no longer allowing Cubans who make it onto U.S. soil to stay in the country, it's forcing people who disagree with the oppressive government there to take to the streets. There's no release valve. The people are in Cuba. If, they, if these young people are conjuring a future, it's no longer a future somewhere else. They have to invent a future in Cuba. And they have realized that the only way they can invent a future in Cuba is without this regime. This whole um, independent uprising of people in cities across the country without a unified leader was all because they started posting, posting about it via social media. And so